Bruce, welcome. Good to see you. I wanted to ask you, Bruce, just to dive straight in. When the pandemic hit in 2020, what was in your mind at that time? What were the scenarios you saw unfolding? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that um, overnight, Anish. Um, I think if anybody told you that in late February and early March 2020, they could see the future, they'd be lying to you. I remember really well in February when the pandemic hit China first. And, you know, although 2019 had been a difficult year, as you say, um, things had been recovering. We had quite a good season, actually. And I remember us all thinking, well, is this going to be like SARS or MERS, and it'll kind of go away at some point. And when I really realized this wasn't um, just a regional issue, I happened to be on a skiing holiday, which was in Austria, right near Italy, and we were seeing on television all those terrible scenes of hospitals being overrun in Italy. So I gave my holiday up after a day and went back to London, and I think it was that point that we realized how serious this was. Um, I think it's fair to say at that point nobody really knew what came next. I think we all believed governments that there'd be a short lockdown and this would all go away. Um, and so, you know, we all set about, all of us, trying to, trying to manage with this. I think the first thing we, of course, did was look after our people so there were no, we shouldn't forget, there were no testing in those days, there were no vaccinations in those days. So. We spent a lot of time designing the best safety protocols we could for all our people across the world. We employed 25,000 odd people. Um, mines are very different to the midstream, it's very different to the, to the retail world. Um, and we did all of that. So our primary purpose, of course, was to look after our people, um, first, second, and third, always. Um, but, you know, as, as, the, as the week turned into a month, and it suddenly the realization dawned on all of us that actually this wasn't gonna go away in a week or two, we all had to start thinking of it differently. Uh, and I guess in many respects, it went on longer than we thought, and it's gone on shorter than we thought, because the last few months have been very different to the first few months. But like all of us, I mean, if anybody says they knew the answer to that question, the answer is we didn't. We had to deal with this as we, as we saw it. Now, the funny thing is all these large corporates like De Beers spend a lot of time designing risk registers, and we spend hours poring over them, and what would we do if this happens and that happens? And of course, no one had a pandemic on their risk register. <laughs> So I guess the lesson is, and it's the, I guess the point of today, is that you've got to be ready for things that you can't anticipate, not just things that you can anticipate. And the good news, of course, is that industry and the beers has come through it much better than you might have thought. But at the beginning, it was, it was a scary time for all of us. Thanks a lot, Bruce. And De Beers, as I think everybody knows in the audience, is primarily a seller of rough diamonds. And you adopted a policy of not selling many rough diamonds at all in that early part of the pandemic. You could, I think it's true to say that De Beers had record low sales for a period. What was your thinking at the time? Why did you do that? You know, uh, um, it was a very difficult time. We try very hard, and I know some, sometimes we do better than others, but we try very hard to sell rough into what we see polished demand going to be. And by polished demand, I really mean ultimately diamond jewelry demand, because that's ultimately what this amazing product we all love turns into. So. Our first thought was if there is no demand uh, at the retail end in particular, um, and then of course India shut down, but if there's no demand, we must be really careful not to sell into no demand. And we forget, you know, retail stores physically did, did close down in, in China in Q1 and in the US in Q2. Um, and so it was a very difficult decision for us. You know, we, we shut mines. Um, people may not understand, but it is not a trivial exercise to shut a mine. A mine is a very large, very complex supply chain. It can take weeks to shut a mine down safely, and it can take weeks to start it up again safely. So those are not decisions we made lightly. In some cases, we shut them for, for safety reasons only. Some of the remote sites we operate, you know, where people are together for 300 people for a two-week shift, if you get one case there, the whole mine's going to get infected. So we shut our Canadian mine. We shut the mines in Botswana for a while because we couldn't ensure that our people were safe. So actually the first thing that drove us was the safety of our people. One thing we did very well in this crisis and very different to the crisis in 2008 is our balance sheet was in much better shape. So it allowed us not um, to make sales that, um, that there wasn't really underlying demand for. So we were very focused on let's wait and see what happens. I always thought, um, and I know everyone in the room always thought, I always thought that demand would recover and that consumers would not go off the category and as we know, anything but has happened. So no one knew when that would happen, but I always thought this, we would get back into better times. I had tremendously supportive shareholders who were comfortable with us not selling, but it was a scary time for us. You know, in the second quarter of 
2020, we would normally sell 1.3 to 1.4 billion dollars of RUF, and we sold 50 million dollars. That's three percent. That Bruce, kept me awake at night. What do you think would have happened had you just tried to sell more diamonds at the prevailing market price at that time? Um, you, you know, as, as I say, Anish, the point is we, we weren't going to do that. But um, I, I think one of the things that we felt from prior to COVID is the inventory in the midstream and the downstream probably wasn't in balance, and we probably would have just made that worse. Yeah. But it was painful for us financially. I mean, as I say, we sold 3% of what we would normally budget to sell. That is not a comfortable position to be in. But we did it on the, on, the, on the real expectation, more than a hope, the expectation that things would recover. When did you start seeing the first signs that things wouldn't be as bad as maybe some of us expected around the pandemic? What were the indicators? I think in, in, in Q3 of 2020, um, and then moving into Q4 of 2020, uh, Virtually every month after the middle of the month, uh, middle of the year, so virtually every month, I guess starting July, August, September, things got better. We started to uh, slowly sell more rough, um, and I think by the end of the third quarter, it was absolutely clear that consumer demand was bouncing back much quicker than we might have hoped, and I'm sure we'll discuss the reasons for that. But uh, it did become really apparent that in the second half of 2020, consumer demand was better, bouncing back better and quicker than we'd expected. Yeah, no, that, that was very strong indeed. And do you think that there's anything that you would have done differently now with the benefit of hindsight if we looked back? Um, I think, I mean, there are always lots of things we would have done differently. I think, um, I think if I take a step back and look at where we are and where the industry is, broadly what we did I think was right and broadly what we did I think was supportive. We tried very hard in the second half of 2020 because we couldn't do this physically, to keep engaging with our customers, to talk more to people, to kind of be out there, although it was virtually um, talking to people uh, with a message that the industry would recover. I think we did that, that well. I think we worked together well. Um, you know, I mean, many small decisions, I guess, are, uh, we could have questioned. I think directionally, I'm, I'm sure we did the right thing. I think the thing for me as a personal regret is it took, for reasons that are not uh, by me, any means, um, have anything to do with anyone in the room. It took far longer than it should have to get vaccinations into Southern Africa, and we had a terrible time in 2021 losing people. Uh, we, we made big contributions, as you probably know, to vaccinations, but I think if, if I look back, one thing I think the world could have done better is distributed vaccinations more evenly. I think that would have got us out of this quicker. No, and for a company that prides itself on safety, I can see why that would have been such an important issue, and perhaps we'll come back to that later. What I want to ask is that we've obviously done well as an industry during COVID. What were the factors, Bruce? Yeah, a lot of factors, I would say, Anish, and I'm sure we all have different views on them. I think some we were responsible for, and I think some, as you said in your introduction, we shouldn't pretend we were. I mean, some there were macro factors that I think played together in a, in a very strong way for us. I think, first of all, of course, the amount of stimulus that um, uh, developed countries in particular poured into their economies, the US in particular, I mean the numbers we know, something like five trillion dollars spent on stimulus packages did create an environment where consumers did have more money and could continue to spend. Um, affluent people, many of whom are diamond buyers, obviously did better out of COVID than um, less affluent people, and that's a big problem for society, but I think it's probably quite, quite good for us, I think that's another issue. I think the fact that, as you said earlier, that people were um, locked down, uh, savings increased remarkably amongst affluent people. I think things like that, I think luxury travel, which I think has got a long way to go to recover to its pre-pandemic levels, less of that I think was helpful. Uh, I think in the midstream, the financing situation is in far better shape than it was. And I think things are, and that's a credit to the midstream. And I think, you know, another thing that I think for me changed rapidly was, was online. I mean, we've always wondered over the years how much will be done online, some of these products are too valuable to be sold online, well I think that's all changed and I think the industry did tremendously well there yeah. uh, and I think but, but for that we might not have been in as good shape. So I think a, a considerable number of different factors, I think the marketing was successful, I think people in times of uh, economic and health crises think about things that matter to them, relationships yeah. matter and we've seen the diamond jewellery industry do better over the last two years than even yeah. the luxury industry, that's very telling to me. People are not just buying diamonds because they're things, they're buying them because they fulfill a tremendous emotional need. 
So I think there's a whole myriad of factors. I don't think it's possible to say any one of them a niche. I think another one is, is supply. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think inventory was more out of balance at the end of 2019 yeah. and is much more in balance now. now that's broadly good for all of us. I mean, yeah. who knows where the world will go. But so I think if, if you ask me in the round, there are a number of factors, and I don't think any one particular factor yeah. uh, is the outlier, but I think those in the mix are the reason why we had such a good time. But fundamentally, what we should be celebrating, I think, is there was really strong consumer demand. And it goes to show the point we've always believed. People really love the category and they love the product. Mm. And so I think the industry has got a positive future ahead of us if we can just build on that. I mean, I think I want to just pick up on one point which I think is, is, is key, which is that diamond jewelry, we all know, did well. I think we estimate diamond jewelry demand went up 20 25% since the pandemic. Other people might have different numbers and, and that's fine. That's the order of magnitude. Swiss watches went up 30 31%. According to Bain, the luxury category went up by 29%. And do you feel we did as well as we're making out when we compare ourselves to other luxury categories? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, stats, stats and damn lies, I suppose. But if you, I think you should also look at this uh, comparing 21 to 2019, not just 21 to 2020, because I think 20, 21 to 2020 is a slightly very artificial. Yeah. Our data would suggest that in the period 2019 to 2021, diamond jewelry did better than all other forms of luxury yeah. over that two-year period. And I think it's more comparable to look back at what was a more normal year, which is 2019, opposed to 2020. So unquestionably, all those categories did really well, and consumer de demand in all those categories was strong. To me, the good news is there's a uh, tremendous resurgence in interest in diamond jewelry, and that's great for all of us. Thanks, Bruce. I want to just drill down into some of the issues around which products did well. An area that really struggled was smaller, cheaper diamonds. And they've had the biggest increase during this pandemic period. Why do you think that is? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, when we at, at De Beers look at product segments, we think that his, certainly historically over time, different segments have performed differently. But mostly it reverts to the mean over time. Mm. And that's because the big diamond consuming markets, particularly the US, actually consume everything. Mm. I think one of the issues in the smalls was that there was more of an oversupply of smalls than anything else over coming into the end of 2019. I think we'll know um, Argyle, for example, came to the end of its life um, and that was expected and planned. Um, and and in, in a sense, I think one of the things that has changed is people now really do believe that the kind of supply issues on the smalls are more uh, realistic than they used to be. So this fear of oversupply of the smalls is, I think, uh, starting to recede. So I think that's one of the reasons. Um, but as I say, I mean, our evidence would suggest that over time, all categories do sell out, but they don't sell out at the same rate. So it's important not to get too concerned in year one, because often in year two and three, you'll see a reversion to the mean. And at the other end of the spectrum, Bruce, large stones and special stones did very well as well. A question from a different angle here. Did you get the feeling that people started to view diamonds of that type as a safe haven investment, as an asset class? I think at the very high end, there is a little bit more of that. I don't think there's nearly as much of that as there is in the kind of art industry, for example. But I think there's no question that there is um, more of that. I also think one of the other things that I feel quite strongly about is changing is brands are more and more important to people yeah. and another of the trends coming out of COVID I suppose is that um, you know people are much more interested in the good that the brands do and yeah. purpose-led brands are going to be very important in the future I suppose that's easier to do in the larger goods than the smaller goods I think it's it's equally important in the smaller goods but I think to, in a sense there's a little bit of that in it as well brands are important and on the other hand and people please correct me if I've got this completely wrong but there aren't that many diamond brands, dedicated diamond brands out there. So if consumers really want brands, where do diamonds fit in? Well, I think um, uh, probably there's more brands out there than you think. I think um, there will always be a place for branded goods and there will always be a place for generic goods. It feels to us, and I think the luxury industry would support this, that more and more people are turning to brands, and a brand is a proxy for trust, really. Mm. So, you know, if you're buying a brand that you uh, know and love, and its social values are the same as yours, uh, it's a natural place to go. So I don't think it means there's not a future for the non-branded world. I think there's a future for both. But I do think over time, people are going to pay bigger premiums for brands than for generic goods. And I think that's something we should all think about. And there are lots of powerful tools out there for us. Absolutely, absolutely. De Beers is a retailer as well. 
and you've got your own stores, and you have many other contact points with consumers as well. Are there any insights you can share as to what the consumer psychology changed, how it changed during the pandemic? Yeah, I think I do think that, I mean, De Beers is, is very focused on building a purpose-led brand, but I think that you do see more of that than you used to before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's obviously more of an issue in America, and it's obviously more of an issue with younger consumers. But I don't see why that trend won't continue, and I don't see that trend is unique to the diamond industry. I mean, you see it in all industries. You see it in the automotive industry, for example. And people think more and more about provenance. They think more and more about um, the, the, what good the diamonds might have done in the world, and they think more and more about do these diamonds, have they done some good in a, in a community in which I can support when I buy them? So um, I do think uh, that has accelerated. I think there's no question we'd all agree that ESG has become a bigger issue than it was, and it should be. It's the right question. The future of the planet is in our hands, you know. So we see far more people asking us far more detailed questions on our sustainability credentials, um, you know, we have a great story to tell. The work we do with communities, the work we do advancing equal opportunity, the work we do with um, ethical standards and the, and, and the work we do with our communities are things we do because they're the right thing to do, but also because I think that's what consumers want more and more. And I know peop everyone in the room does this kind of thing in their businesses. I, it's something I think we should all encourage. We shouldn't be afraid of. No, that's a very useful bit of input and we're definitely going to be talking about the consumers a great deal in the second panel and maybe we're going to pick up on some themes and issues there. But let's turn to the future. What do you think the next two to three years have in store for us as a sector? Well, I think partly the answer to that is in our hands and of course partly we are dependent on, on, on various macro things going on. I, look, I, don't, I, I feel very strongly that medium to long term we will continue to see long term sustainable growth in the natural diamond industry. I see no reason not to think that and I think coming out of COVID, in fact, I'm even more convinced than I was yeah. before. Uh, so I think if we continue to evolve as an industry, and as you know, we as De Beers have been talking about this for a lot, and we continue to do the good stuff that the industry has been doing, um, I don't see why that there should be uh, risks to that. There are always risks. Um, you know, inflation is a risk. You mentioned it earlier. Some of the geopolitical things going on in the world can be a risk. But the world is full of risks. To me, what is encouraging is all the data we have is that consumers feel very strongly and believe very strongly in natural mm -hmm. diamonds. So the question is how do we harness that, harness the learnings out of COVID uh, and continue to build a, a sustainable industry for all of us? Because I think that's the rub, isn't it? I yeah. think if we go pre-COVID, we weren't having that much growth and some would argue we didn't have growth at all. We've obviously done very well in COVID. On the one hand, there's an opportunity to build the momentum. So I want to ask you what you think we should do there. On the other hand, a lot of these factors do feel temporary and they will unwind. People can spend money on experiences. So how, where do you think we will land given those two different things going on? Well, you know, I don't, I don't think we could assume that we're going to continue to have the levels of growth we've had in the last 18 months. That's a bit of a V-shaped recovery, quicker than we thought, higher than we expected it to be at this point, and that's all good, but I think it would be unrealistic to expect the growth to continue at those rates, and I think that's fine. I think for us it's about how do we continue to build long-term sustainable demand, not short-term sustainable demand. I think things like the change in people's online buying behavior is extraordinary. I mean, I know people in the room are investing heavily in it. I think we've all got to do more there. I think there's a very different future for us if we do that cleverly. I think these ESG things I've been talking about are important. I think we have an ability to reposition this product much more as a purpose-led product. Um, and I, I think that will play into millennials and Generation Z, as you call them, um, uh, in the future. So I think if we can carry on building into that, there is no reason we shouldn't continue to see good growth. And of course, as you say, things like luxury travel will come back. And, other competitive sets will also turn up and we'll have to deal with them. But we've been in this industry a long time and we've had many challenges along the way and we've always been able to come out in a positive way, working together. I think we worked really well together as an industry in COVID, even though we couldn't get together. And I think that's an important learning for us as well, talking to each other, sharing experiences and, uh, and not losing the kind, of, uh, the kind of good that came out of dealing with a very difficult period. I think many people in the midstream do, I think, believe, and I think I'm speaking for a lot of us here, believe that De Beers did take a very collaborative approach during the pandemic, and I think it was appreciated by many people. I just want to dig in a bit deeper, Bruce, if you can be a bit more specific. What do you think are the opportunities and the risks in the next two to three years? So not really looking at the longer term, we'll come on to that in a moment, but as we unwind out of COVID. Yeah, I suppose the, I mean, the risks, we've touched on some of them. Inflation is clearly a risk. 
oddly enough, our research shows that oftentimes in an inflationary environment, diamonds actually do quite well. Now, that may be because affluent people do better in inflationary times than you might think. I don't think the past is a guarantee of the future, but it, it's something we'll have to think about. I think, um, you know, I mean, I know there are people who are concerned that, um, you know, prices are not sustainable. I think we have to think about selling our rough as De Beers, and we only think about De Beers, I don't really think about anyone else when it comes to pricing rough, is how you sell it into long-term sustainable demands. I think we have to be thoughtful about that. Yeah, lab grown you mentioned, it's, it's clearly still an issue and there'll be a debate on it later. Um, I think that uh, is an issue still. I think there are trends that are encouraging for the natural diamond industry. And then there are always things you hadn't thought about. And you know, if one thing COVID's taught me is it's not only the known things that can disrupt you, it's the unknown as well. But I think those are principally the risks. As I say, I think on, on the demand side, it's how do we carry on telling the good story about what diamonds do, doing it together perhaps a bit more. Um, I think this online future is really important, and I think thinking about purpose, thinking about what consumers want, thinking about protecting the planet, thinking about this amazing product that has basically built countries in Africa. It's an extraordinary mm. story. Um, um, and so I think if we can carry on harnessing those, collaborating as we've done really well, I think, um, I, don't, I don't see why we shouldn't have a rosy future. One of the things that you've touched on, which is potentially really interesting, is that during COVID, we've seen a growing wealth divide. The rich people have got richer, poor have got poorer. How do, you ex how do you think that social change will affect demand for diamond jewelry? I mean, that, that clearly isn't good for society. I mean, step, let, step aside from diamonds for a minute, and I think society is going to have to think very hard about how to fix that problem. Um, from our point of view, we stopped our minds, as you said, for a number of months. I was really clear, though, that nobody would be put out of work on a mine as a result of that. Every single person who stopped mining would be paid. It was really important that they had money to put food on the table and that we looked after their health. And so we invested more than I think we ever have in looking after communities. So I think one way of us dealing with it as an industry, and I know lots of people in the audience do tremendous good here, is continuing to be really clear about investing in our communities in our societies. I think one of the good things, if there is a good thing coming out of COVID, is, you know, take us at De Beers, for example, there's going to be a much renewed vigor about people's health, mental health, physical health, etc. And so how else can we do those kind of things for our communities? Because we can't change the world, but we've got to do the right thing for all of the people who work in our industry. And I know many people in the room do fantastic things uh, in the communities in which they operate. So I think we as an industry can help in that regard. I think the, you know, the biggest social issue clearly is you know, coming out of COVID. If there's a bigger divide between the haves and the have-nots, that's an, an issue for the world to deal with. Mm. And I think it is absolutely clear that the industry has done a great deal to build social good, build that strong narrative, building on work that, it's, that we as an industry collectively are doing. But the fact remains the wealth divide is growing at consumer level. Is that a challenge or an opportunity for diamonds? I suppose a bit of both. Um, if you think about the growth opportunities, I guess the biggest growth opportunity for all of us still remains China. And so, you know, some of the predictions, you talk about Bain, some of their predictions about how big the Chinese market can get, that's very much about people entering the middle class. Mm. And so I think from a, from a growth point of view, it is important, apart from a societal point of view, that, that that continues to happen. I think in America, interestingly, our data is heavy users are even more heavy users. And so these are generally speaking affluent people who have bought sometimes eight or nine diff different pieces. So I suppose we've got a nice balance in the diamond industry, but it's obviously important for all of us. And there are many other countries I can talk about which could become big diamond buyers if, if people um, enter the middle class. So I think you know, it is something for us all to think about, but it's obviously a thing governments are gonna have to tackle. Let's look at the two countries you've mentioned. So you talk about China. Some people speculate there's a common prosperity policy that will be implemented. There'll be a move away from conspicuous consumption. Some of my friends and colleagues in the finance field are increasingly bearish about China. How do you feel? Why are you so optimistic about China? Look, I think, uh, you know, there's some evidence that China has slowed down a bit in the last few months. And you know that, you know, when their approach to COVID is kind of to lock cities down. And I think in the run up to the Winter Olympics, there was probably a bit of that going on. So there's some evidence that China's a bit slower than it might have been. I don't think we think that the, the change in policy in China is, is aimed at the diamond industry, and nor should it have necessarily a particular impact on the diamond industry. The research, of course, is very encouraging, which is people in China are really positive about diamonds. And if you think about 20 years ago, there was almost no industry there. So I think that there is still a, a big opportunity there. Um, I think 
as I said before, you get short-term ups and downs, but uh, generally the trajectory is tremendous and the consumer research is very positive. How much more do you think China can grow? You know, you see numbers of China being as big as a $100 billion market. I, I, I don't know. Um, what I do know is every time I look at China, there are more stores being opened in tier three and four cities, and I think there's a long way to go there before that's saturated. I think we, we've all got to think differently about how you drive even more demand in China because it is such a growth market. But it's, it's a nice position for an industry to be in, I think, to have a very established market in America, which has been amazing over the last two years, and also a really big potential growing market in China and outside of China and many other countries in the developing world that ultimately can become very big diamond consumers. So I'm not sure. I know a lot of industries that have a kind of a, a foot in both camps. We've talked about the U.S. You've described the U.S. as an established market, and it certainly is. It's been the backbone of our industry for a long time. Do you think we're saturated in the U.S.? You know, when I look at the data, um, I mean, I'm continually surprised by how good the U.S. is and how strong it is. And I think my short answer to that is no. If you look at the biggest category of growth in the U.S., it's female self-purchase, and that continues to grow very strongly. And there's absolutely no reason to think that that is anything close to saturation point. In the more short term, you know, some of the data I see is 2019, I think 6%, 6 out of every 1,000 people got married. It went down to four in 2020. It went back to about six in 2021. And the predictions are it'll be even more in 2022. So, I mean, that's maybe more of a short-term trend, but I think you'll see a bounce back in bridal as, as well. But really, I think the growth part of the US industry is female self-purchase and heavy users. I don't think we're anything close to saturation there, no. No, absolutely. Just a small question around that bounce you've talked about in engagements. In a way, we have seen record numbers of engagements and record number of marriages. To what extent do you think demand in the US has today has bo is borrowing from the future. In other words, we've kind of grabbed some of the forward-looking demand right now. Yeah, I think there is an element of that. And so when we think about the future, which is one of the reasons I think that growth will return to more normal levels, I think there's no question at all that there's been a trend in some people to think, well, I don't know where I'm going to be in three years' time or four years' time, so let me do it now. And that's been good for us. And that can't continue forever. So I'm sure there is an element of future sales being brought forward. Um, you know, as I said earlier, what does give me more comfort, though, about the future is that has not created an imbalance in the inventories around the world. So, yes, I think this strong bounce back we've seen at the end of 2020 and 2021 probably can't keep going at the same rate. I totally agree with that. But I don't see why there shouldn't continue to be decent demand, as I said before. I think we have to just change tact and take a topic that I think a lot of people are interested in the room, which is a current market situation. So many of you have been following the current markets, saw a situation where rough diamond prices were going up a couple of percent a day at times in the last couple of weeks. I, I, just to get a bit of audience input here, can you raise your hand if you are worried about where the current rough market is today? Nobody? <laughs> is anyone not worried about where the rough market is today? Okay, thank you for that interaction at that very <laughs> high level there. Well, that, that answers <laughs> the question. <didn't> <laughs> Bruce, how would you characterize the current state of the rough market? Um, you know, as I, as I said earlier, um, there are certainly reports of um, significant premiums being paid for parcels of rough. I think from my point of view, and to be clear, I can only speak for De Beers here. Um, I and my team are really focused in when we set rough price and we do it very carefully for every site. And we do as best we can set that into what we think will be consumer demand by the time that rough turns into polished for that rough, as in diamond jewelry demand. So we try very hard to match demand and supply, and not to do anything other than that. That's all that I try and do. If other people have a different strategy, I can't comment on that. But to me, it's worth thinking about, does that, that's how I see the most intelligent way of building long-term sustainable demand. But you know, in any industry, there are ups and downs along the way. You talked about secondary prices. We've also seen auction prices that look like they've gone past the point of rough to polish profitability. Why do you think that's happened? Well, I don't know. I suppose, um, again, a combination of things, a bit of, uh, a bit of exuberance in, the, in, the, in, the, in that area, um, maybe people having thoughts of supply shortages. I think there's no question that supply is perfectly stable but isn't going to be as high as it might have been in the past, so I think people might think of that. Um, I think short-term speculation is always into this industry. 
that's not how we like to think about it. We think about medium to long-term stability. So I think there are a number of reasons for that. And this happens from time to time in the industry. Mm. I want to ask you, Bruce, do you have any advice to people in the audience who are currently engaged in this market situation? What would you tell them right now? Well, it's not really for me to give other people advice on, on how to run a business. I mean, that, that wouldn't be appropriate. And you know, I don't understand other people's businesses nearly as well as they do. All I can say from my point of view is our objective is to build long, medium to long-term sustainable growth. And we try and be very thoughtful about that. Let's look a little bit longer term where you are very optimistic. So there's potentially a bit of a bumpy road as we unwind in the next year, 18 months, two years. Long term, you are very confident. Let's consider the economic outlook. We saw inflation go up to 7.5%. It's the highest in 40 years in the US. How do you think this rising cost of living could impact diamond jewelry demand? Well, you know, as I... As I said earlier, the, the data we have would suggest that in the past, more often than not, it, it's been less problematic than you might think, and you can't for sure rely on that. I suppose that's one point. Second point is how long it will last. Most economists still seem to think this is going to be a short-term issue. We all have a different view on that. I suppose the traditional view of things is that it's going to lead to interest rate increases, which for sure it is. That means mortgage costs are higher, people have less disposable income, and so on. That can't be good for diamond jewelry demand. I think... Um, We'll see. I think, as I said earlier, that doesn't necessarily follow for affluent purchases. Um, and I think, you know, as I've said a number of times today, I think the fact that the inventory across the entire pipeline is much more in balance means we are in a better shape to deal with whatever might come along the way. But of course it can be an issue, and it depends how long it lasts and how severe it is. Um, yeah, as I say, every economist that I look at thinks it's going to be shorter term than you might think, but let's hope that's right. No, absolutely. And I think... You've talked about sustainability as a key factor in driving attractiveness of this product, showing more social consciousness. What else do you think we can do to be higher up the pecking order when it comes to consumer spend? Yeah, I think, as I've said before, it's about collaboration. I think we've all got to think about more marketing and more effective marketing. We will have spent, I think, as you'll see when we announce our results, more money on marketing in 2021 than I can remember in my time at De Beers. So I think that's an important thing. I think we've got to think, as you say, about sustainability and how we can turn that into an advantage. Um, we, we struggle as an industry to tell a good news story better. Now, lots of cleverer people than me are in the room working on this. But I think the more we can find better ways of telling um, a good story better, the better that will be for us. And there are obviously lots of tools and platforms out there for us to do it. So to me, it still, it still comes down to all of that. It still comes down to you know, how do we make this product continue to be relevant for consumers. You talked about, during the early stages of COVID, having a few sleepless nights. When it comes to our industry today, what keeps you up at night? What's the thing you're most worried about? <laughs> if you're looking for sleepless nights, it's not an industry to work in, I suppose. Um, look, I still think, as I say, long term to medium term, we're in good shape. Um, obviously, inflation worries me. Obviously, the geopolitical issues in the world worry me. Um, and uh, you know, we'll see how those play out, and, and uh, let's hope that they don't play out in a way that affects the industry. So I think from a short-term point of view, those things do keep me awake. I have to say the most obvious thing that keeps me awake every day of my life is safety. The most important thing for all of us, certainly for De Beers, but I know everyone in this room, is that everyone who works for us is safe and healthy. The pandemic hasn't been great at all from that point of view, and I think we've all got a bit more to do to make sure our people remain healthy going forward. That still is my biggest worry. Outside the mining area, where you've obviously put a tremendous amount of resource and thought and leadership in safety, what do you think the rest of the supply chain could do to align themselves with some of the good work you've been doing? So I see a lot of our customers doing amazing work, um, and I really am, am very pleased to see that, and they should all be congratulated. But it, you know, it all comes down to what people are trying to do. How do we look after our people better? How do we look after our communities better? How do we look after the environment better? So I think our sustainability goal is probably no different to anybody else's. You know, we, we, um, we have these tools at our advantage. We have increasing wealth disparity. What are we going to do to try and help about it? So I think it's the same kind of topics. Climate change is a really big issue for us, for retailers, obviously, and increasingly for consumers. I know everyone in the room is working really hard at that. We've got to double our efforts again. Um, I think it's back to this purpose point, isn't it? If we can show our consumers that we are genuinely going to help fix the climate issues in the world, that's very powerful for us. So I think all those things that people are working on probably need more work, but I think the topics are pretty clear as to what we need to do. 
What about lab-grown diamonds, Bruce? That's one of the other potential risks on the horizon. What's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I continue to, to, to have the view, and certainly De Beers does, that medium to long term, lab-grown diamonds will be what we always thought they would be and what we thought they would be when we launched Lightbox, which is a perfectly legitimate, prosperous category, but not really a category that competes head-on with the diamond industry. And I think or the natural diamond industry, and I think broadly the, the data I see would support that. Now, um, we always said at the beginning of this process that as people got better at producing lab-grown diamonds, there would be more of them, and the cost would come down, and that I think has proved to be true. And I think we see predictions of even more pr production over the coming years. I think that will only mean that there will be, firstly, more of them, so they won't be at all rare. Uh, and secondly, the cost of production will keep coming down. We've seen dramatic falls in the prices of lab grown at wholesale, I mean really dramatic, and actually even online, a bit more mixed at retail, and I know there'll be a, another discussion on that. Um, but broadly, um, I don't really see the category as any different to what we did when we launched Lightbox. Um, and as I say, perfectly profitable, prosperous category, but more in the fashion end of things than in the luxury end of things. And I think that's a really important topic that we do need to cover next in the next panel, which is can lab-grown diamonds even be luxury if they're cheap? But the thing that potentially worries many of us here is that there could be a risk that some consumers buy lab-grown diamonds instead of natural diamonds. So, for example, the Knot magazine, we're not saying that this is true. They reported that one in four bridal stones or rings are now using lab-grown What's your reaction to this sort of potential substitution risk that we could, we could face? Look, of course it's a risk, and um, uh, it continues to be a risk for the natural business, um, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. I, I think the question more and more, though, is going to be uh, even how many of those are cannibalizing sales as the category sort of settles into something that's not luxury. So, you know, as I see it, if they settle into two different categories, there'll be lots of sales of lab grown, but they won't necessarily be cannibalizing the natural. Of course, there's some cannibalization going on now, no question. Um, uh, and I think it's, again, it's down to the natural industry to work even harder in telling the good story of, of what natural diamonds do. You know, natural diamonds do things that nothing else can do. Those are stories we've got to tell. You know, we, for every person that we employ on a mine, they support another eight people. When you look at the supply chains on the mine, they're all local people, local businesses. We support an enormous amount of people through the mining industry. Lab Grant can't do that. And so it's more about, you know, how do we keep telling the story um, and how do we keep giving consumers what we think they want, which is clear transparency as to the choices they're going to make. If we do do a great job and we phenomenally promote diamonds and production is limited, what do you think about the scenario where that difference, that delta in demand is filled by lab grown instead of natural diamonds? Yeah, I get asked that question from time to time. I think if you take a step back and look at global supply of natural diamonds, it's, we always said it was going to peak around 2018 or 19, probably has. But there is no evidence based on everything I know about our production uh, capability and the publicly available information about everybody else's that that's going to fall off a cliff. I think that should continue at roughly the same levels as we have now for many years. So, I mean, that's a good thing. Stable production, but not necessarily uh, overproduction. So I don't really see a scenario, because I still think ultimately diamonds will grow roughly in accordance with GDP, maybe a bit more if we do our jobs a bit better, where there's such a big gap that something has to fill it. I think we're a long way away from that. I think there's been a lot of good material here. One of the things that, to change topic just for a few minutes as we close this session, is that one of the things that you did personally and th through the organization you work together with is show leadership in our industry. What does leadership mean for you? And what were the learnings for yourself during a time like this? You know, I think about that quite a lot. I think um, the way I look at this is leadership's about being authentic. It's about having a clear message and being authentic about it. We tried very hard in, an, in a time when everyone was like worried about what's going to happen tomorrow to get a message out to people that the category remains a powerful category. People like the product. There's no reason to think they won't go, and better times will come. I think in difficult times, leaders have to take on more of a personal role. You've got to be seen more, you've got to be talking more, and you've, of course, got to be calm and stable and positive in these times. I think everybody in the room did that. 
um, and I think that's a tremendous testament. But I think at times of crisis, leaders have got to stand up even more and be counted. And if there's one thing I've learned in my role, it's about being authentic. If you're not authentic, nobody believes you. If you are authentic, it's amazing what you can do. I'd like to thank Bruce for this discussion. At least from my perspective, it's been very valuable. Bruce, I'd like to give you a round of applause. Thank you very much for your Thanks insight. So much. Do you want me to go down there for the video? I'm going to invite Martin Leake to come back on the stage because I